Okay, hello YouTube. Uh, the focus of today's video is going to be sort of how to face the stone wall when they try to get to it from a d4 move order, like say the Kali system. So like after d4, d5, they play a move like e3, and their intention is just at some point to play f4. So what I'm going to be sharing with you in this video is some of the positional concepts of what's going on. A lot of the things that I learned actually as a young player uh, back in the late 90s uh, from a grandmaster by the name of Gregory Serper. Uh, this video is mainly kind of in response to some comments that I got on my uh, How to Curse the Stonewall video from a Blue Slicks 321. And so I kind of wanted to cover uh, what he was talking about, which is he wanted to try to get into a stonewall sort of from a different move order, try to get into the stonewall from, I guess, more favorable conditions uh, for, for white. Uh, so we're just going to kind of discuss that and uh, sort of what's going on here. So anyways, if you like content like this and want to see more of it, please hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. So what I learned back in the late 90s, like way back in like 1997, uh, learning from uh, Gregory Serper. So this was... You know, over 20 years ago, I guess over 25 years ago at this point, 27 years ago. Wow. Okay. A long time ago. Um, so let's say black plays a move like bishop f5 here. This bishop is outside the pawn chain. This is black's bad bishop. So if at this point we were to play a move like, say, pawn to f4, uh, uh, positionally, this is actually really bad for white because black's bishop is outside the pawn chain. So I'll just give like a kind of a brief explanation here. Like let's say we play a move like e6, knight f3, and then something simple, c5, c3, knight c6. Bishop d3, knight f6 should just be advantage black. Actually, the computer gives major advantage black. Uh, so I can't just leave it at that and just say this is major advantage black. I have to give kind of a deeper explanation as to why. And... Uh, in order to do that, I'm actually going to show you kind of what's going on in the reverse of this, where black sort of tries to play a stonewall against any setup, because this is kind of how I learned about it from Gregory Serper. Because back then, I went through this phase where I was playing the black pieces, and I just said, hey, why can't I just wait until my opponent plays a move like knight f3, and then I'll just play f5, and I'll just play a stonewall, and I can just play a stonewall against anything, right? What, why can't I just play a stonewall against anything? I was a young player. I didn't know any better. And apparently a lot of young players go through this phase. I actually found a game where Agenstein tried to do the same thing uh, with black, where you just try to play a stonewall against everything. Uh, but as Gregory Serper pointed out, he said, look, move order in chess is very important. He said, you can't play a stonewall from this move order because white can get his bishop outside the pawn chain. He can plant his bishop on the f4 square. Now, whether or not white plants his bishop on f4, or whether or not he can pin your knight, like if you got a knight on f6 and he can play bishop g5, it really doesn't matter. Like, it, it's just as long as that bishop gets outside the pawn chain, this is just a really bad position for black. And I didn't understand why. And so I started throwing out some moves. I was like, well, why can't I just play something like knight f6? And he said, yes, no, this has been played before. This has been tried. And e3, e6. And I said, well, my idea is after knight on b to d2, I just kind of want to play bishop d6 was my idea. And I just want to maintain this tension. And he said, okay, look, this has all been tried before. He said, people have done this before. And he said, it's turned out very badly for everybody that's tried it. He said, he said, here's the problem. You can never take on f4. And I said, well, that's not a big deal. I'll just, I'll just maintain the tension. But, but more importantly, you have to understand why you can never take on f4. Like, this is really critical. Like, let's say something like this were to happen. Like, say c4, c6, bishop e2, and we just take. We play bishop takes f4. After e takes f4, positionally, you are dead. And the reason you're dead is because you have a backwards pawn, this e6 pawn, sitting on this half-open file. And you do not really have this e4 outpost as a permanent outpost for your knight. Because at some point, when white moves this knight away, this knight on f3, he can always kick that knight out with one to f3. Furthermore, white has no bad pieces. He got rid of his worst piece, which was his dark squared bishop. You got rid of your best piece, which was your dark squared bishop. So you're left with this bad bishop on c8, a backwards pawn on e6, which is sitting on a half open file. And you've done this all so that you can basically etch out the territory of the e4 square, which you do not even own. So when you play knight e4, they play f3, and you're dead. So actually, if you put this in Stockfish, Stockfish just gives this position as decisive advantage white. That's how bad this position is for black. It's just positionally terrible. And this was just something that you have to understand. So, like, you know, I could go a few more moves here. Like, let's just see what happens. You know, something like this, everybody just kind of plays moves. Queen b3, queen b6, c5. We would exchange, exchange. You're going to lose that outpost anyway, as pointed out. Eventually, white could play c3. But th these are all 
you know, what the computer gives or whatever. And it's not great. <laughs> you know, after 92, you're just worse. Like the, the, the E5 squares toast. You've got the rooks on the open files. Nothing, nothing has changed, basically. And it's very difficult to change anything. There's, there's n almost no move orders that you can come up with for black at this point where you can change the pawn structure favorably anymore. You can't play pawn to e5 because white has complete ownership of that square as well. The d4 pawn and the f4 pawn are covering e5 and locking it down. There's no real way to break out of this stonewall structure. So your stonewall structure is actually sort of your prison here. Now, I was, of course, you know, a very arrogant, you know, young player. And I said, well, what's the big deal? Why would I take on F4? I'll just, I'll just do something else. I'll just castle, right? So he said, yes, you, you can do this, but you can't, you can't do this forever. You know, so like castles, castles, knight E4. Eventually, white can just take, you know, it's his, it's his bad bishop, you know, and that's your best bishop. So he can eventually just take. And we can exchange, and then we can just play knight e5, knight d7, knight f3. We can take, take. And guess what? This is major advantage white as well. Because, again, you know, we have the outpost on e5. We can eventually kick this knight out because we can play f3. And this bishop sitting on the d7 square is just perfectly terrible. We can never, we can never, you know, it, it, get it out of there. This is just a bad piece forever and ever. Now, it turns out that just your, your position is worse for positional reasons. So if you reverse this, like d4, d5, e3, this gaining of an extra tempo really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. It's a closed position, and your position is worse for positional reasons. So if you play a move like bishop f5, and then they play some move like immediate uh, pawn to f4, for example, e6, knight f3, c5, c3, knight c6, bishop d3, knight f6, is just advantage black. And it's for the same reasons. We're just advantage black. All of the same positional stuff is going on. And pretty much any move order that you can come up with is going to lead uh, down a pretty similar path. So you can try to find move orders where the stonewall is favorable for white, I guess. But what's really interesting is there's almost nothing that, that black can play in terms of move order that's going to get him into trouble. For example, if you played a move order starting with e6 and then f4, f4 still isn't all that good. Uh, you can play c5, and this is already slight edge black. What's really interesting is I found a really good uh, stem game here, but I kind of want to go into this with a little bit more detail and just point out how there's no, like, I, I kind of want to go under the underlying positional reasons for why this is advantage black as well, uh, which is kind of interesting because you, you, you might note that, hey, both sides have a bad bishop here, you know, just throw the previous example out the window. In this case, both sides have a bad bishop. Black has a bad bishop. White has a bad bishop. Why is black doing better here? This doesn't make any sense either. But it actually does. So, like, let's take a slightly different move order first. Because I think we need to look at this different move order to learn. So, like, let's say knight f6, and then they play a move like, say, c4. And then we play e6, and then they play f4. So they sort of forced it, right? Well, if they force it through this way, you would think, okay, well... This is okay because this bishop can't get outside the pawn chain. So clearly I have favorable conditions to play a stonewall setup. And hey, I'm also being aggressive, right? But you have no development. So black can just open the position with c5. And what you end up here with is slight edge black because black is going to turn this into an isolated queen pawn position where you just have a pawn hanging out on f4, which is actually bad. You'd, you'd rather have this pawn back on f2 in, in an IQP, like if you have an isolated queen pawn. So if you don't see the transposition yet, I'll just show you. It's going to be like knight f3, bishop e7, knight c3, knight c3 castles, a3, and then just eventually we're going to play c takes d4, c takes d4, and then say b6. It doesn't really matter. You could even play like dc4 right away, just reach the IQP. Um, and then cd5, knight d5 is an isolated queen pawn position where you have a pawn on f4. And this is generally considered bad. Like we would rather have this pawn back on f2 so that eventually we can increase our attacking chances by having this bishop at, at the very least cover the g5 square. But maybe we can move it to g5. Um, we can bring our bishop to d3 and uh, eventually back to b1 and queen d3 and pile up on the light squares. And these are the normal sort of IQP plans, uh, so to speak. But the f4 pawn is a huge hindrance in all of them. It just gets in the way. It's a target. Uh, the knight on d5 can target the pawn. The bishop on c1 is essentially trapped inside its own camp just because of that one pawn on f4. And this is not a great IQP situation. Whereas this bad bishop has a great square to develop where it's going to be on the longest diagonal on the board and controlling the 
uh, blockading square, the d5 square. Um, and essentially, uh, I know even without the pawn on c4, essentially the same thing's going on, which is kind of weird, like e6, c f4, and then c5. So there's this game, uh, Niger versus Adley, um, uh, that, that continued uh, uh, pawn, to, uh, pawn to c3, and which is a logical move, because of course if you play something like, say, dc5, just, you know, bishop c5, this is just major advantage black, so obviously you can't take this pawn, you have to just kind of defend your center, knight uh, c3, so then we just had normal development, knight c6, knight f3, bishop d6, bishop d3, and then knight on g to e7, castles, and then here's the point uh, that sort of Adley pointed out, and he made this game look easy, he won this game in, you know, less than 40 moves, it ended in mate, and he made it look incredibly simple. He made he made the black side of this look incredibly simple. But basically, it's the same type of thing. Is you know this e4 square is a permanent weakness. E5 is not. He can control it with f6. And as a matter of fact, that's just what he does. He just says, okay, I'm going to play f6. I have e4. You don't have e5. What are you going to do? And so the game continued. It went knight h4, g6, and then we had knight d2, queen c7, a3, bishop d7. So he's got a bad bishop, but in this case, white's bad bishop is probably a permanent type of thing because he doesn't really want to play e4 because he's going to be hanging material. And if he can't play e4, how does he fix that bishop? But, but black, on the other hand, e5 is a real possibility. And when e5 gets played, this bishop comes to life. Like, black has the fluid center. Black's the one that can eventually break in the middle and will eventually open the position in his favor and have no bad pieces, whereas white does not. And so it's sort of a timing issue. So we have b4, c4, uh, bishop c2, and then he does this ridiculously aggressive move. It's so good. He just castles queenside and just, he's basically just saying, look, I'm going to play e5. I'm going to take over the center. I'm going to attack your king. And I don't think there's anything you can do about it. And it turns out he's, he's probably just right. So, like, the game continued g3, e5. This is just advantage black. So d takes e5, f takes e5, uh, a4, bishop h3, rook f2, e4, knight back to b1, and this is just, like, positionally and strategically, the game is essentially over. This whole queen side never really developed. It's all completely hemmed in. Uh, the, just the positional and strategic domination is, is pretty incredible. All of black's pieces are playing, and basically none of white's pieces are playing, and the game is practically over, uh, at least on a strategic level. Uh, it continued knight g2, h5, knight to a3, a6, uh, we have b5, knight a5, uh, queen d4, h4 takes, and then uh, some pretty moves here happen uh, towards the end. hg, hg, fg, fg. Uh, eventually bishop c5 is going to take place. He can do it at any point, apparently. Uh, king h2, and then we finally have bishop c5, uh, queen f6, takes on f2, uh, check here. Everything's held. Uh, so it's just all eventually going to end, no matter how much stuff comes off the board. But he actually ends the game in a, a very beautiful way. Uh, he ends up getting uh, a checkmate uh, with, with with the rook going to uh, f8, and then the bishop goes to d6. Ends the game with mate, uh, just kind of mating the king in the middle of the board. This is Najir versus Adley played back in, uh, looks like, uh, this is... D uh, Najir versus Adley played back in United Arab Emirates in 2005. So kind of an interesting uh, game there, but basically black was just better the entire time. Uh, so so the point is, is that if they're going to try to play uh, this early pawn to f4, uh, if you get the bishop outside the pawn chain, you have an advantage. If you haven't wasted any time, like if no equity of moves have been wasted, if they play f4 and they've made all these pawn moves and you just play c5, you should have an advantage. So, like, knight f6, c4, e6, f4, c5 should just be advantage black. And every kind of derivative of this should just sort of be advantage black in one way or another. Either you're getting a favorable isolated queen pawn, either you're getting a favorable center where you can eventually play f6 and e5, or you're simply getting your bad piece outside of the pawn chain, you're eventually trading off for his best piece, and you're getting a long-term strategic and positional advantage that way. Uh, but in any case, uh, if black plays correctly, uh, getting to a stone wall through the Kali move order is is probably not advisable. It, it, it's probably better to try to get through to, to, to the stone wall through like a bird move order through, you know, playing one F4 and then waiting for favorable conditions uh, to eventually play D4. 
and get to the stone wall that way. Uh, and as a matter of fact, like at the highest levels, like if you look at the games uh, between, uh, you know, Nigel Short and Yuri Kasparov, uh, when people do play the stone wall with the black pieces, they get to it through a Dutch move order, uh, typically. Or they can get to a stone wall like setup uh, through the Nimzo Indian move order. We reach a lot of setups that are similar to the stone wall uh, and stuff like that. So those are the move orders that people typically get to stone wall setups from where the stone wall setups aren't uh, particularly terrible. Uh, but in the cases where uh, your opponent can kind of make an early pawn break in the middle where he hasn't wasted any time, or in the cases where he can get his bishop outside the pawn chain, generally speaking, it's a pretty favorable thing to play against that stonewall setup. You're going to have some sort of uh, advantage, usually somewhere between major advantage to even decisive advantage, uh, if they play a stonewall under those conditions. Uh, so anyways, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you can use some of these ideas in your own games. Thank you very much for watching.